Hi everyone, welcome to the Biohacking Village at DEF CON. This is our sixth year. I am Nina Ali, I am the executive director. This is my fifth year of running the village. Thank you for coming. I want to let you know that this year has been quite an adventure. It's been very similar to uh, one of those choose your adventure books where it's just so many options and, and you're working through everything trying to make it all work. I decided last year that I was going to do the keynote, but I knew that I didn't want to do it myself. So what I have done is accumulated folks that I know, folks that I trust, and people that have very strong expertise in their fields, and I talk to them. And I want you to know that I did not prep them for these interviews. I did not give them questions beforehand. Everything you see is raw emotion, raw gut uh, reactions. And I think the information is really important, especially right now and for the future of where we are going to go with healthcare and how we can secure it and make patient safety a priority. Thanks for watching. Hey. Hi. How are you? I'm getting you. I'm okay. So I brought you here because I want the biohacking community to see the people that I talk to, see who I engage with, see where, where, where my brain thoughts lie and who I talk to at three in the morning, Eastern time, when my brain isn't, stop, isn't stopping. So quick origin story on you is? I met you three years ago. Um, Jason Street gave us the introduction of Black Hat. And yes, I do remember everything. Good brain. <laughs> Um, and then my talk got accepted, um, home to own my own pacemaker at Biohack Village. We kind of just fell into a friendship, I think. It was just instantaneous, like I knew you my whole life. I, w I remember like with my first talk, we shared tequila. I really needed it. Um, and now yeah, three years later, we're still kicking ass, taking names, and planning big things. We became instant friends and we have continuous dialogues at 3 a.m. Eastern, depending on times here between like 8 and 9 a.m. your time. What are you working on right now? Working on standardizing and defining shit. I'm, I'm slightly tired of us, you know, having this cookie cutter approach to medical security and healthcare security. Because let's face it, you know, this is not a Windows 10 machine or the standard endpoint we're dealing with. But each one has a different way. So why are we making it harder on ourselves by not defining and standardizing? So that's my pet project is just to get the shit right, define it out, and let's understand what we're dealing with. Let's listen to the devices. Let's not do all the talking. Let the data speak. What's your call to action to the community? I think the biggest thing I've realized is as a community, we can't work together, can't listen to diverse objective stories. So just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they're wrong or you're wrong. Um, I think the community as a whole, we should approach this not just about finding problems, we should be finding the solutions. So we should be the builders, the breakers, and the pioneers going forward. But it takes a village, but intended, right? Yeah, I did it. I did a mom joke. Um, Seamless plug. Yeah. <laughs> we need to do better. Shameless plug. Hey, don't always see someone that's five foot nothing. Um, I have an opinion. I have a voice. It's not refined. It's not pretty. Right? I'm going to call it as I see it. But don't always take offense. It comes from a good place. And if you want someone to do log analysis, it is what I eat for breakfast, lunch, and supper. I love logs. I love data. Because I believe we can't wait for something to happen and ask where's the data, where's the evidence. I want to build this shit in now. Because come 10 years, I can turn around and say, hey, you claim you hacked this device? Well, motherfucker, you did not. Who do you want to collaborate with? Everyone. But I see it as a trifactor, right? It's this triangle. Engineering is awesome. And I'm geeking out on it because recently I got exposed to an MDM and I got to see the engineering pipeline, which led me to build 
classes in Python I never thought I'd do because I was convinced the internet would blow up if I designed something. And I realized that we have a regulatory body, we have an MDM, and we have researchers. And that's what's going to make the future better is these three elements working together to strengthen healthcare and medical security. But we shouldn't be imposing things that break healthcare or medical devices further. Because people like me, this one sitting here, I need this device. And if we made it, make it so hard that manufacturers stop doing it, you know, people like me won't have a second chance. So I think you know me well enough that I'm going to throw random things at you. Oh, I can see your brain going. I, I've been expecting it, so bring it on. What's your controversial opinion? My controversial opinion is this, that imposing S-bombs into healthcare and expecting them to take on the manufacturer role is going to lead to it breaking. And the reason being is the manufacturer has the responsibility, the ownership, to maintain their shit, build them better, and keep them safe. But here's the thing, we're expecting hospitals to do this. COVID-19 came in worldwide, globally, swept it, broke it. And this is something they built to do. They're supposed to deal with um, viruses and pandemics. So if we make cybersecurity of medical devices their responsibility, we're expecting them to thrive in something they're not built to do and they're not ready to do. So yes, SPOM for manufacturers, how oh, yes, bring it on, they should be doing this shit. It's manufacturing. This is not a hospital function. As a biohacker that works in technology, how do you want to better integrate with regulatory folks, with political entities, with hospitals, etc.? I just want to be given the opportunity to be heard and I want to listen. I want to listen what they need to have done, what help they need. Right? This is not a me against them. This is saying, let's put our brains together, right? Like one collective brain is not enough. We need this diverse group. And this is why our stalking is so awesome. Because I never knew that patient records was as important as it is until we had the discussion and we had an argument, right? <laughs> We had that, you know, we disagree, but the fact is you showed the data, you brought the data and you changed my mind. And the thing is, we shouldn't be scared to be wrong. We should be acknowledging that, Hey, this is not going to work or Hey, we made a mistake because it takes a stronger entity to do that than trying to hide it. And that counts for MDM hackers, anyone. I have big enough balls to tell you if I was wrong. Because that's the person that I am. I own my shit. How do you want to leave this? What's your message after this? That together, we can change the world of healthcare and medical device security. Because we're dealing with a legacy of devices, an ocean full of them. 600,000 new implanted devices a year. They last 10 years at a minimum. Right? That is a legacy that I don't want to see increase yearly. The time for change is now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, now. Because otherwise we face legacy. It's going to come back and bite us in the ass. And patients like me won't have access to these devices. Because their first and foremost function is to keep us alive and give us clinical and healthcare related support. They're not there to be secure. I mean, for fuck's sakes, if I have to tell the doctor, hold on, you need my username and password, or you need my cryptographic keys, I'll be dead. I saw that. It's, it's in a split second. So let's get this shit right. Let's do it now before legacy comes back and bites us in the ass. I want your controversial opinion on re recording as well, seeing as you're fucking throwing us all under the bus. What's oh, your controversial good. Well played. Uh, my controversial opinion. Huh. Electronic medical records are not looked at by anyone and it's exhausting. You and I had this conversation. It's, it's, everybody looks at medical devices because they're tangible. They're something you can hold on to and you can pick up off of eBay and, you know, find a thing. 
but electronic medical records are hoarded so intensely and they're not in a lot of legislature. They're not really defined. They are not medical devices. And because they're not medical devices, we don't necessarily, we, the group, um, don't necessarily treat them well. But when you look at it, I can have a medical device that does one thing, it holds one source of information, right? Like your heart pacemaker holds your heart information where the electronic medical record holds all of the information. So when you look for that wealth of data and I'm gonna find this one thing that's very specific or I can find the, all of it. And that's what I've done. You Again, I have I've did it for so long that when people say like, this is the most important thing, I'm like, yeah, but you're getting that information how? There's so many links into this one small piece and just no regard to it. Yeah, but I think the problem is because we're not defining the ship, right? Because that is like the ultimate gold mine. It's not necessarily a device, but it's a container that holds everything, yeah. right? If, if those are the keys to the kingdom, it's the ultimate. Exactly. How did that IP. happen? You can have the one thing, you can have the, the pacemaker, but you need all of the other things to make an educated device, uh, educated device, educated to system. There's educated decision. There's clinical mm -hmm. decision support built into this thing that will say this, you're, you're going to give this person a, a defibrillator of some sort. Oh, BT dubs. Did you know that this person, you can't give him this one because of whatever reason this is there's, there's, it's a support system. It's, it's a container. It does all the things. Now you've got me riled up. Thank you. Um, it's a treasure trove. That's what it trove. is. I've, I've done talks about this. You can, I can, I can own your pacemaker and like, Oh, I got a thing. Ooh, it's worth how much? 50? No. 500. I can own a hospital because that's essentially what you're doing. Once you get the EMR, could you get into the EMR and get into everything else because it's all connected because of the APIs because whatever is going on and it's just whoosh, gone. And that is exactly. mind blowing to me. But I mean, the purpose of cybercrime, right, is about money. So what can I sell and what can I keep on selling? And how can I get, you know, have persistence? Exactly. I mean, it's the, it, it's the product that, it, you know, forever paying because everyone's going to want to have yeah. that. Oh, um, and while we're here, because now I'm upset about life, um, <laughs> they're not even connected. So like New York does not connect to DC, which doesn't connect to Seattle, which doesn't connect to anything. So me as a human, I now have to regurgitate my whole life history of all the things that are right and wrong with me because you don't know. I can make all of the things up. I can negate so much information. Did you know that 18% of healthcare workers indicated that for the right price, they would sell yeah. their data? Yeah, insider threat, right? We just over, we overlook it. And there's, there's a print mechanism, mechanism on these things. You just you're good how do you feel about how do you feel about zero trust nina tell us how you really feel <sighs> we currently work on these privilege right these privilege is still an indication of trust it's trust but verify in a way not in healthcare we shouldn't have that there's this is this is sanctified information. This is literally you in data form. And we're just like, here, it's fine, go get it. We're cool, we trust you. You trust me because I work here, but you don't know who I am as a person. You know that I have a certain skill set. but zero trust needs to be better incorporated. It needs to be incorporated better in technology and industry generally, but healthcare needs it more because of the sensitivity and the specificity of the information. You, you roll somebody up, um, on their labs and they're off by whatever number this is. You can overdose them. You cannot do a thing. You can treat them. You, you can give them the wrong blood. You, there's so many different options. You need to know that everything is, is in their place. You need to know that you can get into things and you can't get into things. And this is, this is why the hierarchy is as such. And we're not doing that. And exactly. we are, the, medical is so, it's very flawed, but it's also one of the last technologies to go live with any sort of tech and any sort of security because we've had that cloak of, you know, we're cool, we're good because we are the doctors and we know the things. 
And if I tell you that this is wrong and this is the medication you need, you're going to trust me because you don't have that information. And you're going to trust me because I'm giving you that information. It's the same thing. And we did that Hippocratic, uh, I am the Calvary, did that um, Hippocratic oath of medical device manufacturers should have taken that Hippocratic oath. If you read down the article, I go further. I said, the hospitals need to also take that Hippocratic mm. oath because that is your information. That is them holding you in digital format. What is exactly. the difference? There is none. There is absolutely none. And like I think came about me, you're sly. <laughs> You knew this was gonna happen. No, I didn't. Didn't I didn't think this was gonna. I thought this was gonna be like. Well, baby, do you not know. Not. Me oh my god! I should. I should turn this. You asshole! I should be like. This is everybody grilling me about shit. <laughs> no, it's not. It's us having a conversation, and this is how this works. <laughs> but I, I like the fact that you know we verify but never trust. I like that about zero trust because for long we've done trust but verify. But I mean. Do you think, I'm going to throw this out, that an APT is above attaching a medical device or implanting it into a COVID operative and sending them into a hospital? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So yeah, we shouldn't be trusting bring your own medical device. It should not be a thing. I always love our chats. I just want to- So do I. So, Yusuf Enriquez, two sentences about you. What's your origin story? Okay, origin story. Um, prior FDA, worked in medical devices and medical countermeasure for the FDA, and uh, currently working with Chemical Bio uh, Threat Reduction Agency. Okay, so all those things that you just said, what's the most interesting thing that you're working on right now? Most interesting I'm working on is using quantum dots to test for COVID antibodies. Uh, just started working with the Aberdeen folks at the Chem Bio uh, Center up there in Aberdeen. Uh, and hopefully we could start using quantum dots to test for other um, infectious disease and maybe um, uh, explosives. Okay. If you were gonna rip the guts out of healthcare, what would that entail? The data set. Expand. Um, I think over the last 50 years, it's been 95% European white males. So I don't understand the term precision medicine, given the fact that we've been doing race-based therapy for the last 60 years. Okay. How are you going to do that? How are you going to rip this up? How are you going to change the paradigm? Uh, well, I thought about calling Dr. Collins and NIH and tell him to stop funding all white male scientists, but that might be a little bit above his pay grade. Uh, but I truly believe that we're going to have to start building data sets from the ground up, scratch what's already there, because I think it's complete bullshit. So is your call to action that all white male clinical studies be ended and then bring other folks in? Because traditionally, there's been historic issues with people of color not being particularly keen on signing the paper of a clinical trial. So how, how what? is the best way to get those folks involved? Well, the first thing is, is take the bias out of the folks that's reviewing the clinical trial R01. Okay, so how are you gonna take the bias out? Because that's ingrained, no? Um, yeah, that's where, you know, Dr. Collins is gonna have to do a better job of uh, hiring more African-Americans, minorities, and women um, at the NIH, because it starts there. I mean, the, the, the socioeconomic bias that's already implanted once they look at the application, anything that refers to lack of diversity or diversity gets thrown in the trash. Is that going to solve the problem in its entirety? Um, that'll begin some of the, the solving the problem. And then I think, you know, what you'll start to see is that trust will come back. Um, minorities will trust other minorities to do study. I raised uh, clinical trial enrollment at the Bronx VA just because I was African American. I was able to increase trials because they saw one African American guy in the entire psychiatry department at the Bronx VA their entire time. They had veterans there was that had been going to that VA for 30 years, said they've never seen a, an African American or minority scientist that asking them for their blood or asking them to do a sign up for a trial. So I, from conversations with you, you have a lot of opinions about the EUAs. So what's an EUA? What's your controversial opinion? 
Um, I mean, I think I'm getting a little concerned. I think we're over about 25. I feel like from our conversations, you're a little more than a little concerned. Well, yeah, all right, let's, let's, let's ratchet it up a little bit. I think we're in the red as far as uh, these EUAs being approved because the uh, confidence interval uh, that's required is 95%. We now have EUAs, which is emergency use authorization for COVID testing as low as 65%. So, I mean, you don't have to be a mathematician to see that's a, that's a D on your report card. It's not even at a C level yet. And so these are tests that's being administered and given report thinking that individuals are not, don't, are, doesn't have COVID when there's almost a 40% chance that they do. So what's the workaround for it? So they get their 65, they get their D, do they get extra credit? Do they, is it, what's the workflow? I mean, honestly, I think they all should be taken off if they're not above 80%. I think we're about three months. But then who does that leave? We're in a crisis right now. Again, um, that's where I think America has kind of took their eye off the ball the last century or so, right? We outsourced everything to China. That's the reason why we have slowness in testing now, right? We don't have enough swabs. We can't manufacture a stick with a piece of cotton on it. Right. And so now what we've done is we've rushed out and have all these device companies make these EUAs that are charging a hundred dollars. You take what 20, uh, almost three to four days to get a result back. And oh, oops, it's might be 65% accurate. So you're fucked either way. So what's your shameless plug? Um, I mean, again, I think understandably there's only three that's met the 95%. I think they should go ahead and ramp up. The rest should be scratched unless they have significant data. But how are they going to ramp up? The, the, the production line is not here. The supply chain is not here. Get out. We're, we're America. That's not right? a viable answer when the whole world is in crisis. Well, we, we're not responsible for the whole world. We're responsible for Correct. America. And therefore, oh, and therefore, I think, you know, what has happened is America is focused on bullshit. And, you know, now we can't even supply our own medical supplies. We can't supply our own API for pharmaceutical because we've outsourced 93% is in China and the drug manufacturing is in India. So somebody's gonna have to take a hit on the chin for it, but it needs to start being American made products. So if it's American made products, this also indicates that there's other things in the supply chain in that, in that just workflow in its entirety that need to be changed. If we have sent so many things off to China, they have different environmental protection laws, which means we would have to change them here. So this whole system needs to be recalibrated. How long does that take? What's the effort? What's the funding? Who needs to get involved? I don't think it needs to be calibrated. I think it needs to be detonated. It needs to be start from scratch because it's just not, it's not. It, so it, that's a, right, we have the problem. So you're bringing this up. So what's the solution? The solution is, I mean, again, we got to get back to manufacturing. That's, that's the solution. I mean, we've spent more money on Pokemon Go's and other bullshit, and we've not been able to shore up our supply chain. Right now, if we shut the borders down, we are dead. We don't produce enough insulin. We don't produce anything that is of necessity to us. However, we've spent so much money on other shit, I, I just don't see how we can sustain. We are not able to sustain ourselves right now if we closed all our borders. So Lily makes insulin on Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, and that pushes over here, but we're still not addressing what I just said. So you can detonate and that's fine, but you are still not creating a chain of, you've destroyed this, what now? I mean, again, we have- How do we rebuild that trust? How do we rebuild the, the facilities and get the stuff to make this cotton swab? How do we get from a four day waiting period to a four hour, a, a 24 hour turnaround. Yeah, we gotta shift the money. I mean, the money's being shifted to big corporation. We have to shift the mindset though first, right? I don't necessarily think the money is the, money is always the problem. Cash rules everything around me, correct. But you have to change the mindset of those manufacturers, of the people that, that are in that chain mm -hmm. to make the difference before the funding is even considered. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but again, going back to the individuals that's running those companies, they're, they're not diverse, there's no inclusion, and so they get to make these decisions that are not relevant to, to the diverse population that they say their medical devices to serve. 
No, that, we're still talking about COVID. We're still talking about the manufacturing. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. The manufacturing, I mean, again, I name an African-American that runs a large pharmaceutical company. I'm not well versed in the pharmaceutical companies, to be honest. I'm better uh, with the device. Must, name an African-American that owns a medical device company, a large. Yeah, valid. No, completely valid. Again, that's when you talk about the mindset, you have individuals that's running these particular industry that pretty much only have their interest in their group, right? And so that's where you see with the pharma. Nobody thought that it was alarming that it's 95% European white males. I think everybody did. Uh, no, but the ones that the go. Oh, no, absolutely, yes. Not everybody. <laughs> Not everybody. Not everybody. Because they weren't involved and we're like, why can't I have that med? I saw it on TV. There you go. So what's your shameless plug? For you, what's your shameless plug? I mean, again, like I said, I think for me is it, it needs to be understood that this is a systemic racial issue from the beginning. Um, I don't know how to band-aid fix it. So um, the plug would be to re-engineer the way science is being done, how uh, the scientists are being hired at the agency, because until you have diversity and inclusion, you're going to end up with another 50 years of white, 95% European males in the drug trials trying to treat, which is not going to be the majority anymore in the next what, right. five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? Your shameless plug is about you not fixing the system. Oh, my shameless plug. I, I mean, I don't have a shameless plug. I just, I just want to do good science and, and, and individuals that, you know, I think what I, my big concern is um, there's a lot of innovation going on that's not being acknowledged because of who's behind it. And I think um, what I've seen over my career is that uh, we need to change that because, again, I think all you're seeing is these Me Too products there's no innovation being done at the large companies. Money has been spent on R&D for absolutely nothing at all because I haven't seen any value add to a lot of these products given the fact that it's being done in a bubble by white males and white institutions. Okay, thank you. We met in Abu Dhabi on a plane and had extensive conversations about medicine because happen chance, you are a physician. What's your origin story? So the work on what eventually became telehealth uh, really began with a, a Facebook page. Um, I, back in like 2008, thought that the, the residents could benefit from having a professional Facebook page and that, um, you know, it was a good way to share information and can be used in a little different way than um, kind of just the sharing pictures and, and family and friends uh, aspect of it but the professional societies hadn't really come around to it. So uh, really my career changed with a slide from Queen Elizabeth, uh, because when I, when I showed Queen Elizabeth's Facebook page uh, and that we were not you know, adopting to new technology, even at the speed of Queen Elizabeth, I really do think that that was persuasive. Uh, so I think while I have been given a fair amount of credit for kind of ushering uh, ACOG into social media. Uh, a lot of it was, was Queen Elizabeth's influence. And so the, the work on social media began really with a legislative interest to kind of share stories and new um, legislative items that were coming up and to kind of get, get awareness in a way that was a little more fun and, and socially engaging. Uh, that pretty quickly transitioned from social media to uh, anything that engaged with apps on your phone. And while they are very different, you know, it's different to have an app on your phone that say is a, is a step counter from having a social media profile. Uh, there was enough of a connection through the mobile devices that social media and mobile media, you know, overlapped. And I was doing my uh, health policy training at the University of Pennsylvania, where they, they very astutely had formed the social media and health innovation lab. So I, I joined them and that was really the, the, professional intersection of, of studying the big data and the new types of metrics we could get from things like Twitter, like tracking flu season by tweets and, and, and those kinds of studies. And uh, from there, you know, it really has been just kind of a series of, of progressions where, where you go from tracking health information via Twitter to health information via a wearable device, which, you know, has at least the commonality of, of connecting through apps. 
and uh, ultimately kind of landed where, where we are now, which, which is a, a uh, version of telehealth that is very different from social media profiles, but it relies on things that, that um, you know, engage through wearable devices, patient-generated data, uh, app connections, and then like what we're doing here, which has become routine in, in COVID era, which is the virtual visits. Um, and, and obviously it's exploding right now. So that, that's, that's kind of a, a brief synopsis of how I went from talking about Queen Elizabeth's Facebook page to doing virtual visits uh, around the clock. So you gave an acronym and I'm not sure people know what it is. So what's ACOG? Yeah, ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So I wanna dive into that because that's the kind of physician you are, correct? You deliver babies, you take care of moms. Right, so I'm, I'm a board certified OBGYN and the chair of telehealth for, for the professional society, ACOG. Perfect. So I think a lot of people, when they think of going to the hospital now because of COVID, they're going in for tests and they're going in because they have COVID. But the one surgical suite that stayed open the whole time, or at least generality stayed open the whole time, was yours. So can you talk about what, what happened? What changed during the COVID? Um, just get into that. As with everything, it, it has been a series of, of moving targets and adaptions, and then adapting to maybe an overreaction. So a, a lot of it has um, you know, changed, but the overall essence of it was the, the obvious necessity for still having inpatient care. Um, so the recommendation has always been to come and receive your um, maternal care in a hospital, whether it's a delivery or a triage evaluation, management of blood pressure. Uh, in other words, not recommending going outside the, the hospital. Mm -hmm. And to, to make that as safe as possible, there were a number of um, new, new protocols, some just limited who could be in the hospital. So a lot of it was keeping it to be, being just the patient and maybe one support person, which would often be say a spouse or a family member. Whereas the intention before COVID would have been to have multiple support people, either multiple family members or a doula or, or someone um, you know, like that. So that, that initially changed and, and there, there was some, you know, unfortunately kind of rigid policies that, that did change uh, the birth experience and definitely changed the postpartum experience. As we've gotten better at, at rapid testing and, and symptom screening and, and mask wearing and PPE, uh, th those have become a little more lenient, uh, but there still is an emphasis on getting patients in and out of the hospital as quickly as possible. So, so going home on day one after a vaginal delivery or day two after a C-section uh, would be accelerated in normal situations, but it has kind of become routine right now. Um, and, and then there's the whole, the whole testing element where if you test positive, there is a whole other kind of precautionary protocol that, that gets put into place. And it does mean uh, wearing more masks than you're probably used to uh, for the patient. Definitely it means more PPE for the providers. So it, it looks like a much more kind of medicalized version of the delivery, which um, you know, is, is kind of, is, it's, it's the safest thing we have right now. So you talked about social media and the way that it's working into better patient care. Are you familiar that the FDA is working on something like that, that they're bringing in all of that? Can you speak to that a little bit? So, part of that? so yeah, I, I can speak, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not part of that personally. So is that a call to action that you want to express? I may be expressing that for you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a call to action in that we, we need these kind of bi-directional flow of information. You know, we need patients who can more directly interact with, with decision makers and with, with people who are making the health policies. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, than the initiative you're talking about, but one of the most effective waivers during this COVID era was the allowance of different devices uh, so that everybody can access uh, virtual health even if they don't have, say, some of the infrastructure that, that's not available in all communities. Um, and the examples of that would be like Skype, uh, FaceTime. Most, most communities now, uh, wh whatever, whatever the resource setting is, do have access to cell phones and uh, enough either Bluetooth or internet that they could do uh, a FaceTime visit or a, or a Skype visit. So what kind of, what kind of interactions have you had with the security, the security researcher community and are you are you getting into that realm are you in that realm we're we're 
wading in. We're probably about knee deep right now. Uh, so there's there's definitely an adult an adult swim deep end of this that we have not gone into. But but even in the shallow waters, it's it's been very enlightening because what what we want to um, see happen with this telehealth revolution is the the best kind of transition from optimizing the benefits without falling prey to the pitfalls. And we know with any new technology that those pitfalls are there, uh, often unintended. So, you know, kind of a, a classic example would be any scientific discovery that at an extreme became very dangerous. Uh, you know, nuclear, nuclear fission uh, comes to mind. And when it comes to Facebook and, and social media, I think the extreme of that in the negative is pretty obvious right now with all of the misinformation and all the ways that, that social media can negatively influence uh, public perception of pseudoscience or influence elections. And what we want to do is harness the, the power of these things uh, because social media has also enabled Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. You know, we, we want to maximize the good and minimize the bad. And we're, we're learning right now what are the you know, to, to switch analogies for a second in, in vehicle safety, you know, what, what are the um, anti-lock brakes and seat belts and air traffic control of, of telehealth? And for example, in, in the kind of entry level interaction I've had with the cybersecurity uh, community, we, we don't have much training um, on the physician side. So, so you know, when, when a doctor is talking about a device that might be beneficial to a patient, say like a remote blood pressure device, they probably, uh, you know, genuinely just don't have a lot of training or information about the nuts and bolts of how that works and how safe the data is. Uh, they, they know to ask about it, they know, they know to be concerned about it, but they, they don't have like the, the deeper level understanding. Uh, that, that's just one example of, of how, you know, data privacy is, is totally intimately intertwined with this and, and doctors do have questions about it. So I have two things for you. This year at the Biohacking Village, Andrea Downing is talking about disinformation on social media, and you should also have a conversation with Dr. Christian Demeth and listen to his panel on Do No Harm. I can send you those links after. And the last thing I want from you is how can we as a community, the hacker community, cybersecurity community, help you in whatever next step it takes to get mid-thigh into that water? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, exactly what you just proposed. I, I think we need a lot of these cross disciplinary um, conferences. I think we need to be going to each other's lectures and, and learning each other's worlds a little bit first and then finding out all the intersections. I, I do think ultimately there's going to be a role for um, a lot of these conversations to take place outside the patient doctor encounter. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's already such a short time we have to talk to patients about the things that we're, that we're trained in extensively the immediate health um, of the patient right in front of us, to then dive into really complex topics about uh, cybersecurity and patient-generated data and where that data sits and how protected it is, not only is it maybe beyond the scope of our time limits, it might be beyond the scope of our expertise. Um, so I think finding a way that we can get patients the answers to those questions and get a well-informed citizenry of doctors to feel comfortable enough that they can um, confidently recommend the devices without having to get into all the deep weeds or, or deep, deep end of the pool about exactly how it works. You know, f finding the trusted sources to say, I don't know exactly how it works, but these guys do and we trust them. And so the, here, here's, here's your kind of safety, safety measures. Yet another plug, Meg Dewar is working on a cybersecurity informed consent project that would help patients and help you folks get that information to them. So this is the last question. What is your shameless plug? For this conversation, my shameless plug is to um, have a post-COVID world that looks a lot like the current uh, waivers and adaptations. So it, it doesn't mean that we have to continue all visits via Skype or FaceTime, for example. You know, e even among the the doctors, most have moved away from that already. They use things that are HIPAA compliant. Uh, it's a nice backup to have. So, but but th that's not the waiver that we're looking for, but. But we do need a lot of these other waivers to continue. We, we need doctors to be able to see patients without, for example, a prior existing patient-doctor relationship. We can establish that for the first time virtually. We really need the cross state lines uh, flexibility. Uh, in fact, a, a, a totally shameless plug would be to have something akin to a national medical license, where if you're licensed in one state, you can practice anywhere, the same way that you can prescribe anywhere in the United States with a DEA number, or you can drive anywhere in the United States with a driver's license. 
Uh, we need we need payers to continue to fund this. Uh, they've been doing a, a you know admirable job adapting to the the current climate. We need that to continue, and and we need the um, we, we need the people using it right now to be open to um, still some reining in of of all the new technology. In other words, we know that things like virtual visits and on online care are still prone to uh, overuse and fraud and all the things that in-person care is prone to. So while I'm calling for many of the waivers to, to stay in place and not be reenacted, we will need some new things that come in and, and we need to be open to those so we can continue to, to use it safely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey girl, hey. Hey girl, hey, hey, hey. This is Najla Lindsay. She is on the board with us. She helps us do the things and accomplish all the things that you're about to experience. I have questions. I may have some answers, Nina. I may have some answers for you. Are you ready? I'm gonna get into it. So, okay. what's your origin story? Two, three sentences. Forensic scientist, lover, um, wine lover, um, and I am here to share how forensic science and information security is hand in hand. That's just, that's the bottom line. They are lifetime lovers and part-time friends right now. And I need them to be full-time friends as well as, as well as the lifetime lovers. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. I was going to ask about your shameless plug, but you clearly already got this because that was the title of your talk for last year. So hashtag go to YouTube. It's all Find in there. <laughs> all so. in there, girl. You're up and coming as a researcher. You're doing all the things. What do you need from our community to help you get to that next level? Because if anybody follows you on the Twitters, you just, it's, it's all the time, every day doing the things. How can we help you? Um, how can we help? How can you help me, um, you know, share, you know, the resources that I share, share things that I'm doing with the community um, and reach out to me. I, I'm always open to have a discussion. I'm always open to learn something new. Um, I don't know everything. And I think that the community is full of experts and people that know so much that there needs to be a bridge to, you know, career transitioners like myself um, and, you know, recent graduates and, you know, the people that have been in the industry for years. So I'm always willing to have a conversation, talk to you, um, share my resources um, and, you know, just be genuine in, in your reach as well, um, because it's no sense in being fake with me. I'm not fake with anybody. Just be genuine in your reach and reach out to me, talk to me, um, and teach me something new. Learn something new every day. You talked about your forensic science work. How do you see the, the overlap of DFIR, science, security, technology, healthcare? It's, it's all intertwined. Um, and I like to tell people that, you know, a lot of people that are currently studying the digital forensics, they don't know that that's actually a branch in a discipline in forensic science. And once people learn and actually take into, um, into their work that this is from a scientific discipline, what you do in digital forensics can go to court. Like you can testify based on what evidence you have processed, what evidence you have found, what story you are telling. Um, and that could be a make or break for someone. You can wind up putting someone in jail or you can wind up freeing someone and exonerating them from a crime that they've probably been in jail for for years. And so I always like to remind people that they are together, whether you like it or not. And I think that people forget that you have to take the scientific approach to a lot of things. Um, that scientific method, we didn't learn that just to learn it. We learned it because it actually applies. You have a hypothesis and you have to test it out. Not just once, not twice, various times and with various people because what I get when I do it will be a different result and can be a different result from what you get. And it doesn't hurt to share the information. You're not going to lose anything by sharing what you learn. Um, and I think that it's all it's it's will forever be intertwined as digital forensics um, gets more popular because that's also 
taking the turn and, and being um, the talk of the town of cybersecurity, um, information security, I think it's important that people remember or know, just even learn that this is a part of forensic science. This is a science discipline. And the more you think methodically about it, the better you will be as a practitioner in the field. And that's either as a researcher or if you're working full time as well. So not a lot of people consider digital forensics in healthcare because there are no laws surrounding it. It's something goes wrong, you re-image it, you keep moving, you keep going. How do you see the transition happening? Is it happening? Is it going to happen? What do you see the future? So with healthcare, like, I find that they're always at least five to 10 years behind on making the transition to updated technology, just in general, like just switching to have Windows 10 on all of their computer systems in the hospital can sometimes take much longer um, than, you know, private organizations or government organizations. And so I think that um, the healthcare industry is still catching up, right? You know, healthcare, you know, a lot of people didn't think about oh, I have to worry about securing this device and making sure someone don't try and trip it and increase, you know, if let's say you take insulin, you have an insulin pump and increase my insulin pump or, you know, mess with the anesthesiologist who is very important during surgery because wrong, one wrong dose can kill somebody. So your hospital go down and your anesthesiology equipment is on a network and somebody decides to play with it, you're, you, you're just completely out of luck. So I think that as more people are aware of, you know, the biohacking village, as more people are aware of, you know, healthcare and medical device security and how important that it is to think about security at the beginning and not the after effect, I think that people will start to realize, oh crap, we actually have to take care of this. And I think when, if manufacturers, there's a couple manufacturers that I know that they started um, implementing um, on their websites where you can learn about stuff that has issues. And so they want to make sure that the community is aware so that, you know, they're doing, they have their methods to build in and make sure that everything works better. Um, I think the more that people actually have conversations because as much as, as big and as much as cybersecurity is, they don't talk to each other. Like people within the industry and the, and the organizations don't talk to each other. It's like a hush, 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 hush thing. And I just feel like this is, it's actually the same thing in forensic science too. But I think that the more that you talk, the better we can come together and the better we can build um, these, you know, these instruments and these medical devices, because that's the only way we're going to make healthcare better for everyone. It's not about, oh, you get access to healthcare and you don't. Mm -hmm. You have to think security at the forefront and not at the, at the, at the end of it, because it actually costs you more when you think about it at the end versus with it in mind as you're doing it. So it's all intertwined, all of it. So in recent history, you were part of Share the Mic in cybersecurity. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what was, what was that like? What were the outcomes? Um, that was like one of the best things that I've ever been a part of um, and you know, I, when I got paired with Rachel um, Toback of WISP, you know, I had known of Rachel. I hadn't really talked to her as much, but I had known of Rachel because I wind up um, being able to receive a WISP scholarship last year for DEF CON. So that was very helpful in me attending DEF CON. And on top of that, we just clicked instantly. I learned so much about her um, and we put a plan together. We put a plan because, because you're, you're on Twitter you're not necessarily doing videos, it's a tweet. And you put together some tweets, we put together some tweets, we put together an action plan and just talked about, you know, what it is that I'm trying to do, what it is that you're looking for, um, you know, certifications that you're doing and all of the like. And so we put it together, Thursday night, everything was set. And then Friday, everything, I was at work. I still work in my forensic science industry. So I was at work when all of this was going on, but I knew what the tweets were because we talked through them and we worked through them. And I wanted, you know, funding for my certifications and I wanted to attend the SANS class. And we know, you know, SANS has been um, looked at as like one of the 
main industry certifications to achieve and attend that class. And so I was fortunate to be able to receive a full scholarship to attend one of their classes. I was able to get all of my certification um, certification costs covered. And then they wind up covering all of the black cybersecurity professionals um, certifications and trainings. And to, to still, you know, make that, you know, hey, I'm gonna still get all of these people, um, make that the forefront and say, hey, I'm st I want these people to pro pro progress. I want these people to win. Um, I think that that was amazing. It felt amazing. And I was elated um, all day at work. I was on my, I was just so elated at work. They couldn't even tell me. They was like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm not sure, but I'm here and I'm going to get my work done. But it was just so amazing. Um, and then later on in the day, Rachel and I actually went live on Periscope and we had a discussion about, you know, under, you know, being black in the industry um, and what it is that people can do to help black cybersecurity professionals. And so um, that whole day was just full of adrenaline and full of, you know, happiness and gratitude um, and people using their platform to promote other people's voices that don't typically have a voice. So I loved it. Um, and Rachel and I are still building our relationship in the background and, and learning about each other and things like that. And I think all of the participants are also doing that. So it was, it was amazing. I hope that it continues to grow into something much larger um, going forward. How can the biohacking village participate or do better with it? Um, you, as a biohacking village, I think that you have to make a conscious effort. And then to some people, it, look, it may look like you're being biased because you may focus on underrepresented minorities or things like that. And I think a good way, because normally the biohacking village just does an event during DEF CON, right? Um, I think that, you know, during a year, you know, after, you know, a couple of months later down the line, do, do. Are you secret dropping? You got to cut this out. No, I'm just telling you what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you things that I think that will be helpful. You know, maybe start a partnership or a mentor program with, um, you know, some people. Get people involved in, in it and promote it, you know, consistently. Um, you know, especially during uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Everybody participates in that, right? Mm -hmm. Like last year I did that. I was dropping random tips of the day, like, and doing that. I think that the more that people learn that the biohacking village is out there, the more that people will want to participate and know about, you know, healthcare and medical device security. I think that is, you know, keep, you know, tweeting and sharing, you know, information and reaching out and being personable. I think that's all going to do a world of good as we continue to grow because I'm not going anywhere. Nina, you're stuck with me, just so you know. I was never letting you go. Okay, just so we're clear here. That was never an option. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so, what's your controversial opinion? Whew. Um, wow. Mm. You tripped me up here. Mm -hmm. a good one, actually. Um, my controversial opinion is that I, I see I see people being performative on making sure that black people get heard in the industry, but it means nothing because you're not actually doing anything. And I can see right through you pretending to do anything. And I think that, you know, even with Share the Mic and Cyber, it's I feel like it'll be a moment in time for some people and for a lot of people because you have the same type of people at the top of the industry and they have a lot of say and, it, and the industry follows a lot of what those top people say. So I think sometimes, you know, doing all of this and making sure that, um, you know, people get heard Let's check back around winter time and see what's been happening. Because I know or I feel that stuff's not gonna look the same. 
so controversial opinion, what's your call to arms? My call to arms is don't talk about it, be about it. Go make for the next, listen, we're in Rona. We, it's Rona. You're like, it's coronavirus. Most states, most countries are locked down. Reach out to somebody in the industry, not a white person, not, no, 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 not a white person, not a white male, not a white female. Somebody that does not look like you, that you've never actually talked to either, because you can tend to have a bias against the people that you've already known. And you just choose that because that's your comfort zone. No, 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 we want you out of your comfort zone. We want you to be held accountable for your thoughts, your feelings, and your words, and your actions. Reach out to somebody, a black person, a Latino person, a, an Asian person, somebody not related to you in any way, fashion, form that you've never talked to and get to know them genuinely and don't expect anything in return. Nothing. I mean, not an ounce of nothing. And see what happens to yourself as you choose to develop a relationship with someone with no transactional um, expectations. See what happens to yourself, not for them, for you. Because I can guarantee you when you start to do stuff without expecting anything in return, you feel good and you realize that the stuff and the values and the beliefs that you have now, they can change. They don't have to be there for the rest of your life. And your life's not gonna end because you've changed a value or a belief. It's not gonna end. It's only gonna get better. And if, if it don't get better, I'm sorry, you're not growing and you're, you're gonna be stuck. So choose somebody you've never talked to. Go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the place of people just, I feel like they just Google and just reach out to people. Go on LinkedIn, check Twitter, check hashtags, go on there, go talk to someone, build a genuine relationship, find out about them, reach out and take it from there. Commit to it for the next six months. I'll make it easy. I won't even say a year. For the next six months, into the new year, actually it's five. Let's make it into January 2020 and see what happens. And reach out to me on Twitter and tell me what happened when you did this, because I would like to know. I love that. That's it. I love the passion you bring to pretty much every single conversation. Let's <laughs> <laughs> do it. Thank you. For real. You are very welcome. So fun fact about this quarantine is Cannibal and I started cooking together on the weekends. Um, three hour time difference. He's Mexican, I'm Puerto Rican. We started making dishes from each other's cultures. It opened up our eyes. We're like super homies now. It's amazing. It is probably one of the best friendships I have ever cultivated. And thank you for being on here. <laughs> so quick, just to get to know you question. Two lines, one minute. What's your origin story? All right, origin story. Um, it's gonna be a little bit more than two lines. Okay. But um, I started out in the medical industry. This was 12-ish uh, years ago uh, for a medical device manufacturer. And um, it's, it's kind of how I got into medical and how I got into security where I was brought in actually more of a support role. And I noticed that, hey, these, these devices aren't being patched. Nobody's really taking a lead on this. So I just started doing it on top of my other stuff. And that was kind of it. At, at one point, it, it started rolling up into a, oh, hey, hospitals are starting to get hit with ransomware. This is kind of a big deal. And I'm like, yeah, I've been doing this for years because you guys didn't care about it. Right. Perfect segue. So you've been around the industry for a super long time. So you've seen it go from healthcare instantiation with technology and security to where we are now. What are the biggest differences you see and how much do we still have to go? There is still so much work that needs to be done. 
so, so much work. Um, I think people are more aware. Um, I'm talking about a populist standpoint, not so much the medical industry, but people are more aware of their data, uh, the sensitivity of things, and that security is important, especially on devices that are connected to people or are or those people are relying on those devices for their safety and their well-being. Um, it's things were a mess. They're still a mess, but not as much of a mess. Um, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, one of the things is the the regulations HIPAA. Um, there's there's not enough there. Uh, their their hearts in the right place, but they have no way of enforcing it. The, the, the claws have no teeth. The claws have no teeth. That's kind of funny because it sounds like it's a cat. Um, the healthcare cat. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to bend you on that. Okay. So what would give healthcare policymakers, regulators more teeth? How do they, and just an extension of that. So then how do they engage more with the, sec community hackers to make this better how would you um, like to be engaged by these people yes so that's kind of a it there's no quick easy answer to it unfortunately but this isn't a new issue we've we've known about this for a really long time it's it's one of those things where if we if something were just started now in a, in five six years from now we could look back and say oh yeah, we still don't have a great plan, but there's something. There's there's at least this momentum that we can build off of. Um, getting some sort of enforce, enforcement policy in place, and that usually comes with auditors or or someone that would like basically go to each hospital. Um, some sort of government funding would be helpful because a lot of the hospitals, uh, a lot of people think that hospitals are making money hand over fist because of how much they cost, but they're just they're trying to break even. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of hospitals are running in the red um, and, and they, they really don't have the money. A lot of them don't even have IT staff. A lot of them outsource their IT and it's one of those things where the doctor will call up and say, hey, I want to be able to check my, my uh, you know, x-rays or whatever from home, punch this hole through the firewall so I can, I can get access to my machines. Um, having some sort of standardized IT policy for hospitals that the government can say, hey, here's a framework, you can either use this or use your own, but you gotta use something. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be a huge step forward, just having some sort of basic guideline so that the hospitals aren't fumbling around in the dark trying to figure this out. Um, newer hospitals tend to be better, but there's so many old hospitals that are just kind of like cobbling things on as they go. Um, most of, most hospitals, devices. what's that? Working with those legacy devices that they, that they have to continue to integrate and continue yeah. to protect with the other things that are coming in. Right, a lot of hospitals, especially on the East Coast, have been around since before computers were even a thing. So they're, they're yeah, right, it's crazy. Technology, a lot of them are like, how do I use this fax machine? I almost like oh. that person, I was like, what do you mean about, are you talking about New York specifically? <laughs> yeah, especially New York. <laughs> no, it's actually true, right? <laughs> um, so you're not in healthcare anymore, right? No, I am no longer in healthcare. I've been out for maybe three or four years. So I don't know if you want to talk about the industry you're in, but how does that industry, how can that industry that you're currently in influence what healthcare is doing? So I'm um, a threat hunter red team for local government. And just, just having, so my, my issue with, with that type of work is the hospitals just need to just need the basics. Just, you know, it's, it's great that these devices on the user side have uh, two or, th or MFA, usually three forms of authentication in order to like be able to pull meds or, or change access to a, a patient's record. But on the admin side of things, a lot of those don't have multi-factor authentication. It's, it's single auth. So it's great that the users have to do this, but the admins don't. The, the technical side of things is just like, it's just oftentimes a reused password um, across, the, uh, across the vendor. And I mean, pick your vendor a lot, pretty much all of them have it. So what's your call to action for healthcare or the hacker community, whoever? So many things. There's so many things of like, one of them is just like education. Um, get educated on, on, you know, what hospital you're going to, 
uh, what what standards do they have? What what equipment do they use? Uh, ask them, you know, how is my information going to be used? I mean, as a patient, this is what as you're a patient, about it. as a patient, mm -hmm. um, as a hospital, it'd be one of those things of like, yeah, holding your vendor a little bit more accountable as to what equipment they're putting on your network. Um, so many of them basically say, hey, we're on your network. It's up to you to protect this equipment. Not we're going to harden this stuff because you know because it's we don't know what's there. Right. Um, and, and every hospital is different. There's no standardized network for hospitals. Um, I, I keep kind of going back to the whole standardized policy thing of this is a basic framework. You're welcome to modify this as much as you want. Um, but these are the basics you need to, you know, be able to segment off some of this equipment or have a standardized 2FA or MFA policy for your internal staff and admins. And if you're not gonna have your on-site IT, these are the rules they have to play by. So what if it's a baseline where people just have to meet this very small criteria to, right. to meet? And then from there they can build up, but they cannot go below? Right. Who would, who would be the, the organizing body to lead that or who would be involved in that? Th that would seem like it'd be kind of fall onto the FDA. Um, and there's, they, they have some stuff, but it doesn't really call out a basic framework or some sort of structure that hospitals can, can fall back on if they have these questions that are going unanswered. So we're almost out of time. Okay. So what's your shameless plug? I don't have one. Just, just <laughs> get angry, get, get informed and like realize how, like how poorly everything has been. Um, there, like this is this none of this is new we've we've been talking about this for 10 years and very little has been done uh one one thing i will plug is if you look up the um hhs breach report um whenever there's a breach it has to be notified right. it has to be um reported and you can go and you can read these reports and you can see is like oh look 10,000 records just got breached or uh this other, you know, CVS got breached. There was one recently, I think within the last week for CVS um, in one specific area. And it's one of those things where it's like, it, I feel like nobody's really looking at this. Think about how CVS is networked, right? You yeah. can go to any CVS and pick up your meds. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a singular, a singular one area that got hit. It's right. If you go to Google and you just search for the HHS breach report, that's uh, Hotel Hotel Sierra breach report. Um, It'll take you to a page and you scroll down and you look for uh, breaches greater than 500 or less than 500. Um, I don't know if there's a way to display them both for what I mean, it's a .gov site. So at least you're getting something. Uh, this, uh, so the one I was just talking about is the CVS pharmacy um, and that's 21,000 records or not even records, but individuals. Um, the next one down is 25,000. The one below that for University of Utah is 10,000. Um, you know, 78,000 for the NCP healthcare management company. These are all within the last, you know, seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. This is a lot. And, and it just, it just scrolls every, every day or every few days, there's just another one and another one and another one. And um, I feel like not enough people are, are looking at the breach report. Um, and if you get enough people, you get enough eyes on this report, it kind of paints a picture of, this is a really big issue. And if, if we just followed some basic practices, it could really prevent this. If, and it, it also shows you the, uh, the location and the type of reach, you know, hacking IT incident, hacking IT into incident, unauthorized access or disclosure. Um, those are the ones that you see the most. The, the one at the very top for Walgreens is theft, but, mm -hmm. and, and the one below it is loss as well. But I mean, those are, those are all preventable things. These are, these are easy things that, that can be uh, mitigated. Um, a basic framework, just a very basic framework of how to handle passwords. 2FA has to be required for not just the medical staff, like the, uh, the RNs getting the meds out of the machine, but the techs servicing the machines and, and the vendor companies that are putting this equipment in the hospital should have some degree of um, accountability for what they're introducing to the network. So we're going to see each other later because it's Friday for us mm -hmm. and it's a day. So here, 
for later. Oh. Thanks. Right right. Later. All right, bye. So, Shri, hi, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? So, I'm good. So, tell us about yourself, where do you work, and a little bit about your origin story. Sure, yes. Uh, I've been working on uh, controlling pandemics uh, uh, since the Ebola epidemic. Uh, I got uh, pulled into that by, uh, complete, by, by almost by accident. Uh, I was at a conference, uh, TED Med, that uh, uh, looked at... Um, looking at all kinds of medical topics, but just a few days before that, uh, the uh, Ebola crisis was, uh, was escalating and the CDC director had a press conference saying this is the, uh, at that time it was Tom Frieden, uh, saying this is the, the uh, worst epidemic of his career since the AIDS epidemic. And uh, uh, then so it, it was like, oh wow, if the CDC doesn't have things under control, then things must be pretty bad. So uh, although we were, you know, we're having drinks at uh, City Hall in San Francisco uh, for the, uh, at the conference, uh, it was very hard to relax because we were thinking about, well, what was happening with Ebola as the whole rest of the world was more worried about. So I happened to meet my, uh, uh, a gentleman who became my co-author. He was a, became, he was a Harvard public uh, health school professor. Uh, and it turns out I just was, it, it turned, he, I just happened to randomly meet him there and uh, started, he told me he had a lot of experience with uh, Ebola in, uh, sorry, with uh, health, public health in, in, in West Africa and East Africa and India and a whole bunch of places. So I said, How? wow, so you must know all about uh, what's going on there. And uh, so I just asked him questions. And uh, we just kept talking and kept in touch. And then uh, uh, realizing that there may be some ways to solve this problem in a, a you know, kind of a cool headed uh, way, as opposed to the, all the panic that was being, if you look at the literature at the time, there were people who were openly panicking. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was kind of a strange time. And so, it, uh, so we said, we wrote some things down on paper just started emailing a bunch of people and saying, Hey, could you try this and do that? And, you know, and, and ultimately about a month later, that, that paper, that, 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 uh, uh, got written into a, a, uh, uh, a sort of an article format and we submitted it and it got published in the Lancet. Uh, and then, uh, the president of Guinea saw that and, uh, invited my co-author to, uh, he's, uh, to, to come advise him on how to, how to control the bull in his country. And, uh, he was supposed to be there for two weeks. He, he ended up there for, uh, for six months unexpectedly. You know, and uh, I was there on the phone with him almost every day, just we're working through the details of how you create a national Ebola response. So that's how I got plunged into this uh, pandemics uh, field, uh, just by completely a uh, uh, bunch of random events. <laughs> uh, so, and so now we're in COVID. Yeah. And you had the experience with Ebola. So how is that medical data being, being taken in? How is it being allocated? Where is it going? Okay, so that's great. So uh, the, the data is, uh, uh, is not, it's still not where it needs to be. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of, as we know, there's, there's these big problems with uh, uh, the CDC and the federal government trying to gather the data from all over the country. Uh, and, and our testing is far behind what it needs to be. Uh, but we're probably seeing a very small percentage of the cases that are actually uh, people are having. Uh, this is this is a disease that has uh, asymptomatic infection as well as uh, pre-symptomatic uh, uh, spread. So we're, we're basically only seeing a, a fraction of the of the picture. Uh, and this this is a reflected way we know this uh, is that if you um, so in other words, I think the data that we have is only a small fraction of what really is out there. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make is that. Uh, we, whatever data we have is, is, a, is a tiny, tiny, you know, uh, reflection of the, of the ocean. Uh, so how is the data that we have going to influence COVID care? And then beyond that, once we get past COVID, how is this data going to influence change within healthcare as a whole? Uh, this data is already uh, influencing, I think, in, in a very big way. I think, for example, you know, the uh, like take the state of California. There, the uh, there's a there's a metric called the positivity rate, which is the percentage of tests that get returned that are, that are, that are tested positive. So, if you do 100 tests, how many come back positive? On average, it's seven percent uh, in the state of California, but in parts of the state, it's actually uh, 12 or, or 20 percent, close to you know, 10, 15, 14, 17, 20 percent. Like that's in Central California right now. Uh, whereas in, in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's closer to two to four percent. So the average is not really reflecting the whole state. It's it's really highly variable. So that people are using that data, that percentage to allocate resources. So the governor allocated fifty two million dollars uh, uh, of uh, extra uh, effort, you know, to do contact tracing and a whole bunch of things for Central California based on that data. 
uh, based on that uh, positivity rate. Uh, so that's one way in which the data is really important. It gives us uh, insight into where the problems are. So actually I wanna do current state versus future state. So current state with COVID, mm -hmm. how is that data influencing changes in healthcare? Mm -hmm. And for future state of healthcare, what are we learning that we need to start changing in how hospitals operate, how patient care is done? Mm -hmm. uh, learning a lot. Uh, I think there's a probably a num number of different topics we could uh, uh, talk about in that area. So I could just pick one maybe. And, uh, you know, I think one is, uh, um, and the other thing about this is that it's so, it's so, so fast. I mean, this is, this is happening like at light speed, uh, uh, faster than anybody can even keep up with. Uh, so that's the other part about this. Uh, the data, there's obviously a lot of clinical data in terms of treatment of patients that uh, people are learning about treatments on, uh, on real time, which works, which doesn't. And there's a really the, I think one of the examples that people point to is there's by the U UK National Health Service, uh, where they conducted a whole bunch of, uh, uh, they, they, they constructed a, a clinical trial for a large number of drugs, and they came up with uh, dextromethasone as, as one that has uh, effectiveness for treating COVID patients. And so that's an example how uh, try, they, by properly constructing the trial, they can draw ac accurate conclusions uh, and come up with uh, solutions. So from, from all the... The so I think you've been involved in the, the data couriership of COVID since since it started. Is that correct? A data, data what? The data couriership and gathering since the beginning of this, since the beginning of COVID? Um, yeah, that's so much the data and more the epidemic modeling. Uh, okay. or mo yeah, modeling of the, uh, uh, how, how, you can, how you can control the epidemic. Oh, perfect. Perfect yeah. segue, because that was the mm -hmm. next question. So yeah. what is the data showing you on how to control this? Which of oh, the American... Well society understand about how the data should influence how we're going to control this? Okay, great question. I think uh, uh, one of the things that we can do, so one, the, the testing is something that we have tried to do and we are doing and continuing to improve uh, at some rate. Uh, and it's, it's, it's now in full swing and people are trying to increase testing all over the country and, and make it better, cheaper, faster, which is all good. Uh, it's certainly not been enough. Uh, and so that, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, we want to stop testing. We want to keep going. Uh, but, the, and that will help us find cases and reduce the burden, but they sec we need something else to control the uh, spread and combination. And I think we talked about this on the, uh, uh, on our um, on the podcast. Uh, podcast about how combining it with masks uh, or, or social protections of some kind uh, will, uh, and that could include social distancing or anything could, would, 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 be able to bring the transmission rate below one, the, the R0 below one to, in order to, 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 to stop the spread of the epidemic. And, uh, and, and since we talked at the time, uh, one thing that's come to my, come, become clear is that uh, people are finding that, that the, the virus transmits not only through droplets, uh, which are greater than five microns uh, in size, but also in aerosols, which, which, trend, which are, are smaller, less than five microns, even less than one micron. And these, the properties of these droplets are that they pass right through the cloth or cotton uh, that uh, people have, masks that people are wearing. So although the cotton masks will stop a filter a certain percentage of the, of the uh, virus that's exhaled by the breath or, or incoming you know, uh, in the environment, these, these aerosols linger for many hours and they, they, uh, they, can, they can pass right through this cloth. And so we're only getting partial protection uh, and so one of the things we can do, we discovered, I think this has all happened last, maybe last 30, 40 days, uh, is, um, is that using, um, it's kind of like these cloth masks are like socks yeah. uh, and we need shoes. We need something that's going to be much better uh, if we want to keep walking in the streets. Uh, and, and so that, the one example of that is, um, the, you know, of course, in healthcare settings, people use N95 masks. Uh, and these N95 masks are designed to to stop the aerosols uh, uh, to give you know the, the shoes of the of the industry, uh, except that they've been reserved for healthcare workers because they need them. But the problem is that the more this, the the virus spreads in the community, the more cases they're going to be showing up at the hospital. So you're actually not really solving any problem by, by you know if the people, more and more people getting infected, more and more people showing up at the hospital, and and, and even more people dying. So there are, are actually industrial masks that are not used by the hospital system. This is an example. 
Uh, this is one example. It's a, a NIOSH approved uh, N95 mask. Uh, and it's, it could be used by uh, essential workers or healthcare workers, I'm sorry, non-healthcare workers to protect themselves. And because these people who are um, exposed on a daily basis to the public and to other workers that are keeping the economy running, they, they are actually, they're finding that those are the people ending up in the hospital. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people staying at home who can isolate, it, it, they're much less likely to get the, the spread, the, the virus than the people who are obviously exposed for, you know, and that seems that obviously makes logical sense. So those, these types of masks, uh, another mask is, is this mask here. It's, uh, um, uh, it's from Canada. It's a, uh, um, uh, it's a, uh, it has an N95 filter in it. Um, uh, you know, and it has the third, let me get the other one that I have here. It's like a, this is a little bit more, uh, uh, very industrial looking, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a last American mask. You put it on like this and strap it around. And these are N95 filters. Uh, but the point, the thing is, these are, these are, um, uh, you know, just like a seat belt, they're dummy proof. They're very easy to use. They don't require this big, uh, you know, careful fitting and, and, and healthcare training and all that. They, they're stretchy and the word last America means stretchy. Uh, so that's what we can do is by wearing these kinds of off the shelf pre-approved masks, uh, we can, uh, and putting them in the hands of essential workers, I think we can make a big uh, difference. So last question. Uh -huh. yeah. What's your call to arms from the security research community, from healthcare, from the American population? I call to arms, uh, I think, Right now, this, I, I think I already sort of discussed it a little bit more, is I think essential workers need these masks, these N95 capable masks. Without that, we, un, 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 until this, you know, I think that's really the, the number one thing we need to get done right now, is put them, protect the essential workers so that they don't you know, uh, spread the disease and uh, get sick and bring it home to their families. And, uh, and I think that, that would be the number one uh, thing that would, yeah. Thank you, Sri. From Thank you patientknowhow.com. So go check that out for more information on everything that he's just talked about. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. So for everyone that doesn't know, this is Josh. Hi. Our recording producer for this year's virtual conference. And he literally just got told that he is the next interview for this keynote. So let's all welcome John. Hi. I and just to be clear, he does not work in the cybers. But the reason I wanted you here is literally that reason. Um, you've recorded, I, th I think there's one more talk left. You've recorded 95% of the talks that we've had so far. How's your brain? It is really full because I did not have any understanding of this field before. And I just watched like, 20, I think 28 lectures or seminars or whatever we call them. And uh, I'm just the type of personality that if I'm watching something, I'm really paying attention to it and trying to figure it out. So it's kind of bursting at the moment. So from all the talks you've heard, um, wherein lie your concerns for healthcare? Oh, well, the massive lack of any type of cybersecurity at many HDOs is pretty bad. Um, Personally, I'm going to be working at a small mental health clinic uh, in a few weeks, and I'm sure that I'll be asking them a lot of questions about what their cybersecurity is, especially since we're delivering all of our services over uh, telehealth. Um, so what are the concerns for that? Um, uh, but I also really enjoyed uh, Yusuf's talk about uh, representation in medical studies, and I think that that's super important um, in research uh, coming from, because I'm, again, studying uh, social work. Uh, so coming from that background, that's also really important now, especially now when we see such, uh, you know, dramatic demographic distribution of COVID cases. What are your takeaways? What what should what should we be working on as a security community? What's your greatest concern that that you think we should get to straight away? Well, I thought Sri's takeaway on getting masks to uh, getting masks to essential workers seems like the most urgent takeaway from any of the uh, any of the talks now, just because that specifically saves lives. But I don't think that's really cybersecurity. So I don't know if that really answers. Why not? It's part of the maker space, part of it. So then if, if we're going to go back into the security side, 
being that you've heard 28 intense talks and I'm not sorry for that. And you're going to go into social work and you, you have an understanding. You may, you very likely have a better understanding of how healthcare works now and the security around it more so than a lot of other patients out there. This is a patient as someone going into the hospital, what, what's your, what's your takeaway? What's, what's your greatest need now as a patient walking in? Well, I've never liked to go to the hospital and I, and I sure don't now, but if I did, I think I would just make sure that either myself or uh, a companion who was with me um, double checked that whoever was treating me or administering medication or other treatments um, has my correct record and that the information is correct, that my blood type is correct, things like that. I would just double check things, which I, I, already, I always cross-examine a doctor when I talk to them anyway. And I think that being an informed patient is really important. So I think, that's, I think that the potential for accidental mishaps is probably the thing that would concern me the most. Okay. How do you think our community can engage more? You know what? Not even our community. How can your community engage more? What's my community? What is your community? My community right now is my son, my wife, and my dog and me. Okay. So how can your community engage more in the healthcare security side of the house? Wow. I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll be talking to people at the clinic and so forth and people that I, you know, study with in social work school and professors for all my classes uh, moving forward now for the next couple of years uh, because I have attended this conference as the video producer. So I think it would probably be in the form of conversations with people uh, you know, in the social work field from my perspective. Okay. What questions do you have for the security folks, the biohackers? I think I did have a question. Societal change, I mean, changing social policy. One thing I do know from studies and from just a career in journalism is that changing social policy in the United States, even when we're at a World War II level uh, event like we're having right now with the coronavirus is still tremendously slow. Um, I think that, and this kind of goes back to the other question about outreach. I think that maybe people in the community need to be doing more outreach uh, through people that they know whether it's on, you know, probably on social media, uh, just to sort of raise questions um, and try to stimulate some dialogue about what people should be, what regular people should be prioritizing in this situation. And, you know, I mean, it's going to come down to who people vote for in November, but it's also, it also comes down to like, how are you going to spend your time online on social media? You know, whether it's, are you going to be sharing memes or maybe having a, a, a substantial conversation with somebody in the community who might actually have some suggestions for how to improve the situation. Um, I know a, a few people just by virtue of living where I do, uh, it's very IT heavy, um, you know, neighborhood. And we have people who've been building respirators in their or ventilators in their rooms or designing software for it or, you know, building masks and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that kind of community outreach is really important. I think that, you know, that is maybe the type of thing we should be using social media more for these days than spreading bad information. So I wanted to make sure people knew who you were because thank you so much for being part of the village this year. There's so many people that are involved that don't get the accolades that they need. So thank you everyone that I interviewed. Thank you for trusting me enough to come in cold. I want to thank the organizers for this year. It, it was, it was a work of love and thank you to Bo, Sydney, Andrea, Bill, Najla, the volunteers, the sponsors, the device folks that are working with us. We appreciate you attendees so much. Watch this space. Enjoy the show. <laughs>